Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the Anointed One of God. And let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day. It is a day that you have made and we rejoice in it. Heavenly Father, today we are looking at the fact that your Son, Jesus, is going to come again. He came the first time. And he did the work required of him. He saved us. He reconciled us to you. And then he ascended to you and is seated at your right hand. Heavenly Father, now we wait for the time that he comes back. Only this time he's not coming as a meek and mild child. He's coming back as king and lord and judge and ruler of the earth. Heavenly Father... We pray, O oh Lord, that today you would anoint my tongue to declare the message you have given to me. And we pray that each of us would receive it into ourselves, into our hearts, into our spirits and souls. We pray, Father, for you to bless this word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are ten days away from the world's yearly celebration of the birth of Jesus, who is indeed the Son of God and the Christ, the Anointed One of God. There is the yearly hustle and bustle of preparing and planning for times with family and friends, and no doubt this is a special time of year. Though we know that Jesus wasn't born on December 25th, by celebrating his birth we acknowledge that he did come. We recognize that all the words of promise that God made concerning what his son would come to do when he came the first time, we acknowledge that he kept all those promises. Living more than 2,000 years after Jesus' birth, we are living in the time that precedes his second coming. It would be wonderful if the extensive preparations people make to celebrate Christmas were equally given to prepare for Jesus' second coming. Sadly, this is not the case. Far too many people don't even give a thought to the fact that Jesus is going to return. Yet, he is going to return in the not-too-distant future. Now, how can I say that Jesus will return in the not-too-distant future? I can say it because Jesus gave us signs to watch for. Signs that are all around us. Though I often point out the signs that Jesus gave in Matthew 24, today we're going to look at Luke 17. Luke was not a direct disciple of Jesus. He was a physician. He came to believe in Jesus. He knew many things concerning Jesus, and so he sought to write down an orderly account of them for a man whose name was Theophilus. The purpose for writing them down was so that Theophilus might know the certainty of the things in which he had been instructed. Luke has two specific chapters which give us the signs which will occur before Jesus comes. We find them in chapter 17 and chapters 21 of Luke's Gospel. And today we're going to begin with chapter 17, verse 22. Then Jesus said to the disciples, The days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. This verse isn't all that clear. Is Jesus telling his disciples that there are going to be days ahead of them, when they're going to be longing for the good old days when they walked and talked with Jesus as they were doing then? Or is Jesus pointing to a future date? It is possible that, you know, both are being referred to at the same time. No doubt there, are, there would be days in the future after Jesus ascends into heaven when the disciples will look back at the days when Jesus walked and talked with them face to face, when they will long for those days. But those days have gone forever. The memory of them certainly is going to stay with them. But their master would not be with them physically, that is. He'd certainly be with them, but not physically. 
It is more than likely, however, that Jesus speaks of the future when he tells them the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. The most important thing Jesus' statement settles for his disciples was this. He would not be returning to earth in their lifetime. His return would be for a future time, which he's going to describe beginning in verse 26. But before Jesus lets them know what those days will be like, he tells them what they are not to do. He's also telling us what not to do in the process. Surely there were going to come some people who would claim that Jesus had returned. As Jesus states in verse 23, And they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. Now why shouldn't they go after these reported Jesus sightings? Because Jesus is not going to come and return in a way that's going to be ordinary in nature. Listen to what he says in verse 24. He says, For as the lightning that flashes out of one part of heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. Stated differently, when Jesus returns, his coming is going to be as obvious to all as lightning. Everyone will be able to see him come. And his return is not going to need CNN, MSNBC, ABC, or Fox News, or any other reporting agency to cover it. It's going to be that obvious. Now, before that happens, Jesus states that first he must suffer many things and be rejected by the generation which witnessed his first coming. And we know, of course... That he did. The first time Jesus came, his work was that of reconciling man to God. Sin had separated man from God, but man could do nothing to reconcile us to God. We had no remedy. Jesus came to do what we could not do. A future day couldn't come until Jesus took care of that most important piece of business. And as we know, Jesus did exactly what he said he would do, and then afterward he returned to the Father who had sent him to earth. Now, how then does Jesus describe the days that would precede his second coming? He does so as follows. He states, And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. What's interesting about these verses, is the use of the word days plural and day singular. You see, there were many days, about a thousand years worth of days, leading up to the day when Noah went into the ark. But there was one day, one day when the judgment of God began to fall through rain upon the earth. Likewise, there were many days leading up to the day when judgment by fire and brimstone rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighboring towns in the plains beside them. Now, since Jesus spoke these words that we have recorded for us in Luke 17, there have been nearly 2,000 years' worth of days since he spoke them. And in this time, trouble has had a chance once again to fill the earth. And though Jesus has not returned in any of the days since he spoke these words, there will come a day, there will come a day when the judgment spoken of by God, by Jesus, throughout the scriptures, will come upon the earth. The lingering question we have, of course, is this. How close are we to that particular day? 
By referring back to the days of Noah and the days of Lot, Jesus informs us of the nature of the sins which will be filling the earth at that time. God didn't destroy the earth in Noah's day for no reason. And he didn't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for no reason. We know the two stories. Genesis 6 tells us that the sons of God came down from heaven and married the daughters of men, whichever ones they chose. Not only were the sons of God who crossed the boundary God had given them wicked, their hybrid offspring were wicked as well. The wickedness was so great in the earth that God actually repented of ever creating man on the earth. Wow. The sin nature of Sodom and Gomorrah was also sexual in nature. Their lust for the angelic visitors, the men who came to Lot's house in Sodom, would have turned violent except that the angels blinded the eyes of the men of Sodom so that they could not find the door to Lot's house. So by referring his disciples back to Noah's day and Lot's day, Jesus lets us know what kinds of sin are going to be filling the earth. The sin, first of all, is first going to include the hybridization of human DNA, either through the advancements of science or through sexual encounters with more fallen angels. Also, human beings will again be seeking to satisfy their sexual appetites in ways that are disobedient to God's natural order. Men will lust for men, women for women, and the degeneracy will even descend to involving animals. Sadly, much of what Jesus reveals regarding what the conditions will be like on earth prior to his return is happening right now. We can't ignore this fact. If we do, then we are failing to remain watchful for the day when Jesus does return. Earlier, Jesus spoke of what we are not to do when we hear reports uh, that Jesus had come but not in the way that he states he will come, like lightning. Now Jesus tells the people what they are supposed to do when he does come. Beginning in verse 31, Jesus states, Even so will it be when the Son of Man is revealed in that day, he who is on the housetop, and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember, Lot's wife, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. Jesus' order for the day when he returns. Remember, listen to this. Jesus' order for the day when he returns is this. Run, flee, do not turn back. Run, flee, do not turn back. Don't turn back to take anything out of your house. Go. Lot's wife, of course, turned back. She was turned into a pillar of salt. She was destroyed. If we want to live days after the day Jesus' return comes, we will flee away from our homes and our businesses and whatever else of value the world values. Okay? Jesus then reveals what's going to happen on the day that he returns. He says, I tell you, in that night there will be two men in one bed. The one will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken and the other left. Now I think we need a bit of clarification on the word translated here as bed in verse 34. The Greek word is cleanus, cleanus, okay? It can be translated as bed, but it can also be translated as a couch for sleep, sickness, sitting, or eating, okay? More than likely, Jesus is saying that two men are reclining together at a meal on a couch, but that during that time, one will be taken and the other will be left. So what does it mean? One will be taken and the other left. Now, 
people who believe in the rapture teaches that Jesus is speaking of the rapture here when he states one will be taken and the other left. And of course there was a whole series of books called the Left Behind series and movies were made from some of them. What is taught in the Left Behind books by Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins is that at the rapture, all who believe in Jesus will suddenly disappear and be caught up in the air and be with Jesus. That's what they teach. The question is, however, is this what Jesus means here when he states one will be taken and the other left? Jesus gives us the answer by pointing to what happened in the times of Noah and Lot. In both of those cases, the righteous weren't taken away. The wicked were. Okay? Jesus told the multitudes who had gathered to hear him that it was going to be the meek, the mild, the humble who would inherit the earth, not the wicked. That the wicked will be taken away and the righteous left behind is further verified by Jesus' answer to his disciples' question asked in verse 37. After hearing, I tell you that in that night there will be two men in one bed. The one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken, the other left. Two men will be in a field. One will be taken, and the other left. The disciples answered and said to him, Where, Lord? Where? So he said to them, Wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Now, it's like, what does that mean? Cheryl asked that question Friday. She goes, what? What is that? We were, we were picking songs. And she goes, what in the world does that mean? Well, here's the thing. No living person is ever sought by, the per, by a question, where is so-and-so's body? I mean, if someone is alive, the question is, where's Jennifer? Where's Andrew? Where's John? Where's Melissa? Right? You know, where's Rosie? Where's Helen? Where's Cheryl? Where's Carol? Yeah, where... Where, uh, okay, if however a person has died naturally or who has been killed, then the question becomes, where's the body? Where's the body? So Jesus' answer to his disciples' questions regarding where the bodies of those who will be will be taken is, Wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. So what does that mean? Jesus' words means that the bodies will be found wherever the carrion birds, the eagles, the vultures, will be gathered together. We know this. We see this all the time, circling up ahead, you know. If you see, you know, vultures or whatever circling up ahead, you go, oh, did something die? Are they out there looking for something or whatever? You know, carrion birds gather wherever carcasses of dead animals are to be found so that they can eat the animals down to the bones. I know it isn't a very pretty picture, and yet we know that the day is coming when this is going to happen. Now, how close are we to that particular day? I began this message by stating that I believe it could be very near. We do appear to be in the days of Noah and the days of Lot. You know, couple these two signs with the additional signs Jesus gave in Luke 21 and Mark 13 and Matthew 24, we get an even clearer picture of the nearness of the day. On any given day, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but on any given day, there are nations that seem to be on the brink of war. There will be wars and rumors of war and so forth. Earthquakes are increasing in the earth. Just earlier during the night here, during the day in the Philippines, there was a 6.8 earthquake. There have been many, many aftershocks after that. Now, it hasn't been reported by anyone, any of the uh, mainstream media news, but the alternative news sites do report this. Since the 7.1 earthquake in Ridgecrest, California, on July 5th of this year. 1.5 to 2 million earthquake events have taken place in and around the area. 1.5 to 2 million earthquake events. Now, 
That's unprecedented. Not all of those are felt, but they're recorded. Okay? But they have had shakings and shakings and shakings. It's not just centered around Ridgecrest, but all up and down California. It's like that, uh, that whole area has just come alive with quakes. Also, we know that drought and famine is occurring worldwide. Fires are devastating nations. And I don't know if you've read this or not, but this year, for the very first time, the Alaska cod fishery is closed for the 2020 season. The number of cod present in the waters of the Gulf of Alaska is just too low to allow for fishing this season. The fish are supposedly dying off because the temperature of the water is rising. And surely, surely we have not forgotten how the flooding throughout America wreaked havoc this year with farmers and ranchers. All this means, I believe, is that we need to be vigilant in our watching for the Lord's return. He is going to come. Will we be ready? I pray so. Amen.